Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show. On this episode, we have a lot of stuff to get into. The Twitter Elon trial, the trial of a century is beginning. They're having their first meeting where they're going to argue over whether or not Elon Musk has to buy something that he no longer wants to buy for $44 billion. Now I'm gonna be honest here and just give you my full take on this subject, what I think of Elon's case, what I think of Twitter's case, how I think this trial will end up. And I'll do that in this episode. But we also have other big news to go over. Starbucks, one of my biggest holdings, announced that they're closing 16 stores, profitable stores, in Democrat-ran cities because of crime issues. And this has been this bizarre adaptation of Starbucks that's causing a lot of news and a lot of drama, and I wanna give you my opinion on this as well. Also, we have Netflix earnings after hours today. We get to see how that turns out. This is one of the few companies that I have in my growth portfolio. It's been beat up this year. And Netflix is in that same arena and the same thing that Disney's in. Disney has been my biggest loser so far in the passive income portfolio. So across the board, streaming companies and entertainment companies have not done well. They haven't proven the economics. They haven't proven that they can make money. For the big companies like Apple and Amazon, they're loss leaders. For Disney and Netflix, they're not very profitable, at least with the streaming portion of their company. Company. And so all of this works together. Netflix's earnings report doesn't just reflect on Netflix, it also reflects heavily on Disney. And Disney investors should pay attention to how other streaming companies do. Now I'll give you some predictions on their upcoming earnings, and I'll also go over some news related directly to Disney, which is that Bob Iger, he reportedly said that he regrets tapping Bob Chapek as the CEO. This may be incorrect, I haven't verified this, but it seems very accurate to me, and I'll go over why I believe Bob Chapek really regrets picking Bob Iger as a CEO. So welcome back again, everyone. We have a lot to get to in this episode. Let's go ahead and jump right in with the portfolio update. For those of you new to the channel, we gain thousands of new subscribers every month. This is a show about money, about finance, about stocks, about current events related to the financial world, and we do things real here. I have real money invested in my portfolio. This is not some play account from a trust fund. This is my money that I've worked for, that I saved up over years of time, and I'm investing. I'm doing value investing, which in my opinion, value investing defined as taking stakes in companies, treating them as ownership of businesses, and having those companies grow and return profits to me, the shareholder, over long periods of time. I show this develop every single week with transparency, meaning that I show both the losses and the wins and the time that I make good investments over this period of time. I have disagreements and different opinions on different subjects than other investors. One of them is that I don't try to time the market. By that, I don't try to buy in in anticipation of the market going lower or the market going higher. And I think this past 30 days is another example of why that's difficult to do. If I filter by the one month period, we are up 9.63% over the past 30 days. Now, I don't mean to brag, but the past 30 days of the S&P 500 is up 3.87%. So the passive income portfolio has crushed the S&P 500 over the past 30 days, and it is steadily beating it year to date. This is how important it is to be in the market. It's very difficult, I would argue even impossible, to predict the ups and downs in the immediate future. And so instead of trying to do that, I think it's much more likely to predict the outcome of good companies over long periods of time. Now, in this portfolio, I've broken it up to all these different sectors, these different categories. And one of the new additions to the portfolio is the restaurant category. This has moved up to become my second biggest category. Meaning out of all of these, restaurants is now the second from the top, just behind tech. Now, why did I invest $70,000 into restaurants this year? The reason why is because in anticipation of recessions, restaurants sell off big time. This happens almost every recession. You see a recession coming up, you hear talks about it, restaurants don't do well in recessions, so the stock price goes down. Domino's Pizza has dropped something like 30% now, from 562 to 406, so this company's down pretty big. Texas Roadhouse was trading up to 105, and now the company's traded down to 72, so it's lost roughly 30% of its value. And Starbucks is by far the most beat up. It traded to 125 in 2021, and now it's traded down to $80 a share. So all of these companies are companies that I've wanted to own for some time. I like their futures, I think they're good companies, and they've all traded down substantially 
just from the price they were at last year in anticipation for the recession. So that's why I ended up buying a stake in these three companies. They got sold off more than other high quality companies that I think have very bright futures. Starbucks being sold off the most is where I put the majority of my money. Now, a lot of people have criticized me in the comments for buying restaurants at a bad time. I don't agree with that. My reasoning is I own these companies for a long period of time. They're in part of the cycle where they perform poorly, the stock price goes down. And once we get out of a recession in a year or two, whenever it starts to recover, the stock prices for these companies can go up rapidly. When the market starts to recover, investors want back in on these type of companies and I'm patient enough to wait. I was originally in the red on Texas Roadhouse. I was in the red on Domino's Pizza. Now both of these have moved back up to the green at least temporarily. And I was in the red on Starbucks by over $7,000. Now it's by $3,400. So they've made up a lot of ground in just the past 30 days. And I'm 100% convinced I will make money on all three of these holdings. But out of these three, Starbucks is arguably the one with the most concern, the most problems going on. And one of the problems at Starbucks is actually a new one that caught me off guard. It's safety concerns. The new CEO has been meeting with lots of baristas going to different locations, having them express their concerns. And they have a lot of normal concerns like their schedules, being overworked, that type of thing. But one of the concerns he says a lot of them have is safety. Let's listen to this report. It's one of the nation's most iconic brands. And now in some of the country's biggest cities, Starbucks will close stores. Though it's only 16 locations in regions like Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, and Washington, D.C., the closures are making headlines because the coffee giant is citing safety concerns. We have to provide a self safe environment for our people and our, and our customers. And men, the, the mental health crisis in the country is, is severe, acute, and getting worse. Starbucks now telling employees it'll offer additional safety training to de-escalate situations and could close restrooms. Of the 16 stores the company is closing, at least two recently unionized. Starbucks says that didn't play a role in their decision, but some employees and even the LAPD police chief have criticized store closures. So out of the 16 stores, two of them are unionized and they're saying that Starbucks is using this as an excuse to close those two stores. Maybe, but I think it's unlikely. I don't think that this is the strategy that Starbucks wants to go with to fight the unions, but there might be some validity to it. Who knows? I'm disappointed to see uh, Starbucks or for that matter, any uh, commercial engagement uh, give up. Here's a Los Angeles police chief saying that he's disappointed in Starbucks. When they're closing, they're closing these locations because he's not keeping these stores safe. He's letting drug addicts and people hang out in the bathrooms, causing customers to be concerned. That's the reason they're closing the store. And he's saying that he's disappointed in Starbucks. He's disappointed in Starbucks. The amount of irony in what this guy's saying is incredible. But Starbucks is hardly alone. After brazen thieves ransacked local retailers in San Francisco, Walgreens and Safeway closed stores or adjusted hours. It's a scary situation, a scary time. And now in Southern California, a manhunt is underway after a series of robberies and shootings at 7-Eleven stores in three separate counties. After two were killed, the 7-Eleven Corporation recommended L.A. area stores temporarily close. Tonight, for some retailers, the cost of doing business is far too high. The officer says he's disappointed in Starbucks. This is a disappointing thing in the U.S., to be closing commercial businesses in U.S. cities because of safety concerns, because of violent criminals that go in and either loot stores or drug addicts that hang out in the bathrooms. Supermarkets, restaurants, higher security, limit hours to combat crime. And like they reported here, Starbucks is not the only one facing these problems. Starbucks said last week that they're going to permanently close 16 U.S. stores after work is reported incidents related to drug use and other disruptions and would likely close more. Casual dining chain noodles has encountered drug use in the bathrooms in certain markets and is training workers on how to respond. During an internal forum at Starbucks headquarters Wednesday, interim CEO Howard Schultz said that the stores were profitable, but the company was closing them because of employee safety concerns. Howard Schultz is on a mission to regain the confidence of the employees, to take care of them, make sure they don't get hurt, make sure that they feel like they're being taken care of so that they have less likelihood to seek unionization. That's what he's trying to do is prove to the employees that Starbucks can take care of the employees and they don't have to go to unions. 
He says, quote, we are facing things that the stores weren't built for. We are listening to our people and closing stores. So this is rather depressing news, not just for Starbucks, but in general, having to close these stores for safety concerns. And I think there's multiple reasons why. If you kick out people from the bathroom of a Starbucks, whether or not they're drug addicts doing illicit activity, it looks bad. It can turn into a PR disaster. So it's in Starbucks' best interest to just close these stores, pack up, open up stores in different safer locations, and move on. And that's exactly what they're doing. So when I look at this, I'm actually happy to see that Starbucks is signaling to their employees that they care about their safety. They want to take care of them. They're putting the employee's safety over the profits of the company. If these are in fact profitable locations, they could choose to keep them open, but they're not doing that. And the person you should be disappointed at is the police chiefs running these cities, making it unsafe for people to operate their businesses. Not Starbucks and the many other businesses that are closing locations. Overall, I'm still bullish on Starbucks. It's trading at 81.74 right now. I'm still in the red by a hair. The company has a free cash flow yield of 3.84%. This company produces a lot of free cash flow, even with the headwinds they've been facing. So I'll remain invested in this company, and I think I'm very likely to make money in this holding, given enough time. Now, moving on, we have to talk about Twitter and Elon Musk. The first days of the trial are starting. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I think this is very simple. In my view, this is a very simple cause of a trial, and it's a very simple trial. Elon Musk wanted to buy Twitter for $44 billion. He signed a binding unilateral legal agreement agreeing to buy Twitter for $44 billion. He did so while waiving due diligence. And afterwards, the stock market crashed. His personal wealth went down dramatically as Tesla went from $1,100 in share price to $700. So his personal wealth went down. Twitter's value arguably dropped dramatically as well during the market crash. But Elon had still agreed to buy the company for $44 billion now having overpaid to a huge extent. And he wants to claw back the deal. He wants out of the deal. Not because he found out about some bot issue, which he knew about prior to the deal, and he agreed to buy despite knowing about it, but simply because he doesn't want to buy it anymore. I think out of this case, Twitter has a much stronger case. I've read both legal arguments, both Twitter's lawsuit and Elon Musk's rebuttal, and I think Twitter's lawsuit is much more compelling. I think that they're arguing the truth. So despite their political views, you might politically agree more with Elon Musk than you do Twitter. If you put that aside, Twitter has the better case here. They had an agreement that he would buy the company for a set price. They had all the proper disclosures. And Elon Musk, in my opinion, is trying to come up with excuses to claw back this deal. One of the primary excuses here are the bots. Twitter, which filed its lawsuit last week, says its process for estimating fake accounts and malicious bots is rigorous. But the focus of today's hearings may dwell more on the language of the merger agreement than how to count the number of bots or fake accounts on social media networks, according to the legal experts. Quote, there is no reason to go into how many bots there are if a fair reading of the contract said Musk essentially waived that right. So that's the first thing. They say that Musk is citing at least two different reasons tied to the spam and fake accounts to leave the deal. One is that Twitter allegedly misstated facts about the data in a way that could have a material adverse effect on its business. So that's the first thing that Elon Musk has to argue. Since he signed a binding agreement, in order to get out of this agreement, the bot thing has to be such a big deal that it would cause a material adverse effect, which the standards are very high for that, meaning it would crumble Twitter's business. Delaware law allows for companies to nullify mergers if material adverse effect has occurred, but its courts also have tightly circumscribed that condition for such an outcome. So they'll be looking for something provably damaging to Twitter, their business model, their advertisers, their future, and Elon Musk has to come up with that and prove that. But again, I think this whole thing is silly. Elon Musk doesn't care about the bot issue. He cares about getting out of this deal because he overpaid. If the judges do this correctly, they would enforce specific performance, which would force Elon Musk to buy Twitter at the agreed upon price. Or they would fine him the differences above a billion dollars in damages occurred to Twitter over the duration of this trial, because the damages to the stock price have been more than a billion dollars. But we'll see what happens. This is one that's not only difficult to rule on, but it's also difficult to enforce. It's difficult to force someone to pay this much money for something they don't want to buy. 
It's been done before in a much smaller extent, but not for 44 billion. Now moving on, let's go ahead and talk about Disney and Netflix. Now before we move on, I have to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor of this video, which is FTX US. They're a very large cryptocurrency exchange. And most people are aware that you can buy and sell crypto on FTX for lower fees than most of their competitors. What they aren't aware of is that FTX is moving into different verticals. And this is something exciting for me because I'm not big into cryptocurrencies. I don't own any of them. I like things that I can do fundamental valuation on. I can look at the cash flows the thing is going to produce. And with stocks, you can do that. This is currently in beta, but they are opening it up to wider access every single week. So you will get access to this eventually. The stock platform is free. The trades on it are free. You can do fractional shares. You can buy and sell anytime the market's open. The interface is very simple. And the brokerage, the stock portion of this is FINRA and SIPC insured. So go ahead and sign up now. Create an account with one of the links in the pinned comment below. There's one for desktop and mobile. When you sign up, make sure to use the code Carlson. My last name that lets them know that I sent you so it helps out the channel. And it gives you $10 once you do your first $100 trade. So let me know what you think. So far, the people that have signed up and gained access to this have really enjoyed it so far. Netflix is going to report earnings today after the bell, and this is a big one. This is one that people pay attention to. Netflix is one of the first companies to report, so there's a lot of pressure on it. And if this earnings report is awful, if they earn less money than expected, if they have way more losses in subscribers than expected, this could be really bad. If they have over 2 million subscriber losses, I expect the stock to fall dramatically. That would be my expectations. So a lot of this comes down to that subscriber number, but Netflix and Disney have a lot going on and a lot to prove. Netflix is down big year to date and over the past year. It hit a high of 691, now it's down to 190. But Disney's had a similar dramatic fall from its all time high. If we look back earlier last year, it was at $201 per share. Disney got above $200 a share. Now the company trades at 98. The stock price has been cut in over half. And these stories are very similar. Disney's trading on its subscriber and streaming growth. It's not trading on its parks. And Netflix, of course, trades on its subscriber growth as well. So both of these companies are tied to that same business, which is streaming, which the economics of it haven't been proven yet. Another thing about Disney is as this company has moved into streaming, it's caused the free cash flow of the company to fall dramatically, down to 0.87%. 0.87. This is the lowest free cash flow yield of any company in my entire portfolio. You can see what's happened right here. Here's the free cash flow year by year. Disney was producing 3 billion, 4 billion, 6 billion, 8 billion, up to 9.3 billion. And then since 2019, right when they started Disney Plus, down to 1.73, 3.6, and then in 2021, 1.99. This is not a lot of cash flow. And this is what investors are worried about. Is streaming a profitable business that can generate real cash flows at the end of the day? We have Disney having a difficult time making money with Disney+. Plus. They're in the early innings of it, but they're still not profitable with their streaming portion. And then we have Netflix today that's going to report a massive subscriber loss. So on both ends of the story, we have companies that are having a difficult time growing subscribers. And if they are growing subscribers, a difficult time monetizing those subscribers. Across the board, streaming is proving to be a more difficult industry than initially anticipated. So Netflix obviously has struggled a lot. It has a lot to prove to investors that this can be a good economic industry to be in. And this will affect Disney. If Netflix can prove to be profitable in streaming, they will then prove the economics of streaming as a whole. And if they can accomplish that, it will be reflected in Disney's stock price. If Netflix fails in their goal to monetize streamers to the point where they can become free cash flow positive, that Disney's going to be affected by that negatively as well. So a lot of this comes down to how this entire industry does. If you're an investor in Disney, you should be rooting for Netflix to do well. If you're not, if you think that Netflix is going to fail, that they can't monetize streaming, then you're investing in a company that's going in the exact same industry and that doesn't speak well for Disney. Now, Netflix is reporting earnings today and they're going to lose subscribers. So they're going to have a net loss. The big question is how much? Netflix's internal forecast was for losing 2 million this quarter. And then there's third party forecasts saying that they're going to lose 2.8 million. So a lot of this comes down to how many subscribers Netflix is going to lose. And if they can turn around their business, if they can turn it around and gain subscribers over the full year. 
but what, what's the number that you think, the over and under for subscriber losses that, that would just shock people or, or please people? I mean, look, I think anything that comes in a million or less this quarter, but again, I, I don't even think this quarter is two, as- though? Could it be two? It could though? be two million, but, but again, they, again, losing subs in Q2 has always been a weaker quarter. I think the bigger issue is, is the trend going to reverse it? Or is this company adding subscribers meaningfully for the full year or not? That's the key swing factor. Right now, the market is saying they don't believe it. Like That is the fundamental view. Investors, they haven't just given up on Netflix. They've given up on the entire streaming sort of sector. They well, just don't like this category. Look where Disney is trading. Yeah. Rich is exactly right here. Investors don't believe that Netflix is on the right track. They don't believe that Netflix can correct this ship, put it in the right direction so it gains subscribers over the full year. They think that Netflix might just continue to bleed subscribers from here on out. And that reflects again on Disney. He mentioned that the entire streaming sector has traded down in response to Netflix. Disney was being treated with the Netflix multiple last year. And once Netflix's multiple came crashing down, so did Disney's. Now, Netflix has announced that even though they're losing subscribers, they're going to try to do new things to grow subscribers. One of them is an advertising tear. And they're doing that advertising tear. They made the deal to partner with Microsoft, which I was incredibly excited to see. Microsoft is one of my biggest holdings. I've grown this position over the past year by a lot. As the company's traded down, I've added a lot more to it. So I currently have $39,000 of value in Microsoft. And one thing people often forget with Microsoft is that they are an advertising company. In fact, they do $10 billion in revenue per year from advertising. So that's a significant business line. Most people think about Microsoft as just subscriptions, just corporate contracts, they do advertising as well, and it's beyond just LinkedIn. And Rich comments on Netflix moving into advertising and what's really important about this move. I think one of the things that gets lost in the advertising world, the only thing that matters is time spent. You don't get paid for having a subscriber in the advertising world. You actually need people to watch. The leader in connected TV advertising is actually YouTube. Like YouTube is the juggernaut. Almost 50% of all connected TV advertising today flows to YouTube. Hulu is about 20%. Everybody else is tiny. And that's really why when investors are looking at Netflix, the opportunity is huge because Netflix is the only company on planet Earth that has more time spent on connected TVs than YouTube. Now, obviously, some of it will be not ad supported. But as you think about the advertising opportunity, Netflix is the one that has the time spent. People are spending over two hours a day watching Netflix. That creates a very big ad opportunity. Doesn't mean they're going to execute well. Doesn't mean it's going to be successful. But the but opportunity is they massive. Need, they With advertising, like YouTube videos, the amount of time, the length of the video is a factor. If you have a 30-second video, like a TikTok, then you can only run one very short ad. Nobody wants to watch a 30 second ad to watch 30 seconds of content. But with a 20 to 30 minute YouTube video, you can run a minute or two of advertisements. So the amount of length of content is an important factor. And like he mentions, Netflix has people watching for two plus hours a day, which the only real competitor to that in terms of time watched is Google with YouTube. YouTube is the massive player in advertisement. Disney's not there, HBO Max is not there, Comcast isn't there. These other companies can't compete with watch time as of yet. So if you're a Disney investor, if you're a Paramount Plus investor, if you're into any of these streaming stocks, you probably wanna watch how Netflix does. They are the biggest, they are gonna run into issues that these other companies haven't run into simply because of their lower subscriber count. So in terms of Netflix and Disney, I personally think that this quarter is going to be tough for Netflix. I don't think it will be pretty, but I think over the long run, Netflix will continue to grow. That's my assumption. I think they will continue to gain subscribers. And I think that streaming is going to be an economically good business to be in. It will generate profits, revenues, and free cash flow. Disney is a company that right now they're not generating the amount of free cash flow they should because they're in the early innings of their streaming business. They're putting a lot of their cash flow into streaming, reinvesting that to further grow those streaming numbers. But I have not been impressed with the management side of this company. Bob Chapek has not impressed me. I think that he's damaged Disney's reputation. He's caused a lot of enemies across different political aisles by causing division. And this is a problem because he's the current CEO of the company. He will remain the CEO of the company for at least the next three years. They just re-signed his contract. 
So if he can't get his act together and get Disney on the right path, stay out of politics, and get this company moving in the correct direction, I'm not going to be holding Disney forever. I'm going to give him more time, at least till the end of this year, 2022. But if we get more unforced errors, more blunders from Bob Chapek, waving into politics, causing problems with their key figures, causing more enemies and different groups and political figures, then I'm not going to be holding Disney long. I'll give him till the end of this year. We'll see how this stock does. But as of right now, I'm bullish on Disney as a business, but I'm not bullish on their management. And the management has been so disappointing that I've considered selling out of this company. But right now, I still consider it heavily undervalued, so I'm not doing that. So I'll be holding Disney until the end of this year. We'll see how it goes. If I think the management team has learned and improved over the past year, then I'll hang on to it. If not, I'll be moving this money into different holdings that aren't causing this type of drama. So that's all for today. We are back up to $25,000 in gains, and this is continuing to grow fast. So I'll have another update out later this week with more news, more current events, and different things I'm doing with my portfolio. But that's all for now. I'll see you in the next.